And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. Coming to a straight, coming to a straight from Good Brother Studios, creator of creator of the upcoming Five E meets Supers project known as Legends of the Metaverse, the one, the one and only, the man better known as Bill. <laughs> hey, How are you doing today, man? <laughs> hey, Mildred, how's it going? Thanks for having me on. Thank you, thank you for thank you for coming on. So, I guess I'll start with the humble beginnings, as is tradition, as was the style at the time, and. Op and open with the question of um, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick? Oh sure, yeah. Um, I'm not sure how old you are. I'm probably maybe a couple years older than you. I got a D and D basic set in the mid '90s. Um, at that point, I didn't even know. I truly didn't know what a role playing game was. I got it for Christmas. I think my family thought it was like a board game. <laughs> And then, like, uh, I, you, you know how, like, everybody complains about role-playing game books where, like, the first couple pages, like, it's explaining, like, what a role-playing game is. But I was actually the kid that, like, needed that explanation because I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think a uh, story that uh, as old as time, I just didn't have anybody to play with. I didn't know, like I said, I didn't know what a role-playing game was before I had this, the basic set. And I, I couldn't find anybody to play with me. But I loved reading, and I thought it was really cool. And then years later, uh, late 90s, early aughts, I fell really deeply into computer role-playing games, specifically Baldur's Gate and Baldur's Gate 2. Mm -hmm. And so that was really my uh, kind of education in, in um, uh, Dungeons & Dragons uh, and role-playing games, sort of, uh, of that ilk. Mm -hmm. And then um, right around the time of 4th edition... Uh, me and some buddies at work decided we were going to get a game together. None of us had ever played before. We all kind of had the same origin story. You know, we had uh, learned about uh, role-playing games as kids, but never had a group to play with. And we just couldn't make heads or tails of 4th edition whatsoever. Uh, and so that kind of fell apart. And then um, years later, uh, we started. I started playing Pathfinder um, and then transitioned into 5th edition. And I've uh, been playing since then. Now... That br that brings me to um, uh, we're given the given the fact that Legend of the Metaverse is a soup is essentially a superhero hack of the D twenty system, much in the same way that Mutants and Masterminds started as that with um the third edition rule set. Um, were you were you were were you largely a stickler for um for for D for D and D and its various editions and side projects or did you di did you dip into other systems over the years? Yeah, uh, it certainly dipped. I mean, but di dipping is uh, uh, sort of a qualified term because I was never able to sort of convince my group to step outside their comfort zone mm -hmm. across several groups, I should say. Um, but I loved reading these things. I loved reading Mutants and Masterminds. I thought it was brilliant. Um, but every time we tried to play, things fell apart pretty quickly, usually at character creation. Um, so it would be like me trying to like lead a group of players through character creation and mutants and masterminds and then them sort of either quickly or slowly losing interest um mm -hmm. and then the idea was uh, okay so if if fifth edition is is graspable it's either you know we play with groups where there are people that are completely new to role-playing games um in which case fifth edition is there that's the only thing that they know or people that are ne not necessarily new to role-playing games but fifth edition is their preferred system mm -hmm. and so th the idea was sort of like is there a way where i can garden path these players to a different kind of game while still keeping them uh in familiar territory yeah. now that brings me to the to the fact that um legends of the metaverse is a is a supers game and I know I mentioned um, Mutants and Masterminds earlier, but were there any other um, Supers games that you had dipped into reading-wise? Yeah, I I, uh, I really liked um, uh, Marvel Heroic Role Playing, uh, I, but again, I, I never this isn't a game that anybody would ever play with me, so it was just me <laughs> reading it. Um, but it seems like a great system and really well built uh, and oh, really it was, interesting. It was, and um, <laughs> um, 
speaking as somebody who did run a lot of run a lot of it and spent way too much time on um on on sites like plot points um there there were a lot there were a lot of really good hacks that came, that came about from it and um the fact that the the whole the the whole game getting go getting ghosted the way that it did is one of the reasons I have a grudge with Marvel. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Marvel's kind of notorious for maybe not uh, supporting some of their licensed properties as well as some people would like. Um. They support. They gave a they gave a fair amount of freedom to the t to the TSR Mar Marvel games, but um, then there was the time when they tried to make their own game. Um, in the in the early two thousands with Marvel Universe, which was a diceless game, which is a hard sell even for ve even for veterans. <laughs> sure. And at the same time, they wanted to integrate that whole power grid thing that they were pushing at the time. And with all of that, had the gall to think that they could compete with Dungeons and Dragons third edition. Yeah, yeah. I always say the the second best thing about role playing games is actually rolling the dice. It's there isn't there is a there is a sp there is a space for diceless games but it's a very specific space and no matter no matter what the di the um diceless setup is going to be a hard sell yeah it's something very satisfying sort of tact like uh tactilely uh about holding dice and rolling dice and you know uh it's a very satisfying mm -hmm. procedure now with that, with that in mind, when it came to, I uh, I've asked this kind of question with a lot of people who do things comic book related. But um, did you grow up more as a Marvel guy or a DC guy? I was a diehard Marvel guy. I grew up. Uh, I started reading comics in 1991, so we're talking like the beginning of that big um, X Men mutant boom. Mm -hmm. And X Men number one by Jim Lee was probably I don't know the 12th or like 15th comic I ever bought in my whole life. So um, yeah, I dipped into DC briefly with death of Superman uh, the year that death of Superman occurred and they had the reign of the Superman all summer long. I was collecting those Superman books mm -hmm. and then um, probably didn't get back into DC stuff until I was an adult. Which unfortunately meant that you probably had to, you probably had to suffer through countdown. Uh, yeah. And Countdown was a, uh, we just hey man, it wasn't my cup of tea. I know there was a lot of talented guys working on that, and and I'm sure they worked hard on it, but it just it wasn't for me. There there <laughs> were a lot there were a lot of, um there were a lot of talented people, but even even the even the even the talented, but one of those talented people was while he was responsible for good stuff, he was also responsible for stuff like Battle for Bloodhaven, which was also terrible. So remind me who did Battle for Bloodhaven? Um. I'll also, I'll also look that I'll also look that up cause, since it's been a while. Yeah. But the fun the funny thing is is that Bloodhaven is the is the was the ter was the territory of um, Nightwing and he's barely in it. <laughs> oh jeez. Um. The. Let's see that was um. The three names on the three names on that thing were Justin Gray, Jimmy Palmiotti, and Dan Jurgens. All talented guys. Mm -hmm. All of them, you know. I don't think anybody, you know, would say that any of those guys is is untalented. Um, but yeah, sometimes, sometimes you just have some misfires. Yeah, I mean, there some some people more than some people more than others. I mean, <laughs> there was a point in, there was a point in time when when Frank Miller was the was the guy to rip off when it came to comics and well you've seen what you've seen what he's done since yeah but i i still see the sparks of genius and did you read that um dark knight the master race at all i did i did not uh so it was you know it, was it the best thing that frank miller's ever done probably not but i i always just like the casual brilliance of it i i won't you know spoil the whole story but essentially you know um the bottled city of candor right um it, these uh, people in the city escape and they become large uh, so they're no longer sort of miniaturized and each one of them is a superman because they're from krypton right um just the casual brilliance of like i was aware of the bottle city of candor for i don't know most of my life i knew that that city was from krypton i knew that there was just kryptonians living on there but it, it never occurred to me that like oh yeah there's a whole 
city full of supermen just sitting there. Why don't we do something with that? Um, so, I, I, you know, there's definitely still sparks of brilliance in, in things that Frank Miller does. With that in mind, what prompt what prompted the creation of um, Legends of the Metaverse? Um, yeah, you're it, right. Was it just um, was it trying was it just trying to create um, 5e meets supers, or was there a different path? It was that it, it was trying to get my gaming group to um, play a supers game, um, and so started as, as sort of just a, a hack of 5e. Um, this would have been right just pre COVID was when. Um, I had sort of like the first uh, design document laid out. And then um, when COVID hit, um, everybody was on quarantine. And so, and so Good Brother Studios is a, is a three-person operation. It's me, um, it's uh, uh, Loquacious Lindsay, and, uh, and Jazzy Jeff. And so we were, everybody was on lockdown, and we had a bunch of free time on our hands. And so we started working on this more and more, um, and then found that our group really liked it. And so we just kept working on it and didn't stop. Yeah. Now, with with that with that in with that in mind, um, as I as I under, as I understand it, the set the setup the setup that you have that you have when it comes to character creation after um, setting up ability scores is um, ber is birthright, origin, class, secret identity, um, optional feat, and um, flaw. And I'd like to go I'd like to go through those. Because, especially since what we effectively have here is some is some is some sli is some slightly extra um, steps compared to five um, e character creation, and I'll start with um, birthright. Um, what what does what would um birth what would a character's birthright entail? Think of a birthright. I mean, thematically, think of it as you're born with these unique abilities, or you're reborn with these unique abilities, right? So you're an alien from some strange, distant land. So these abilities are inherent in you, or you're a mutant, and so you have lived a nice chunk of your life like everybody else, and then suddenly you have this sort of rebirth where where these powers manifest. Mm -hmm. um, mechanically, just think of birthrights as. Um, races in, in D and D fifth edition. Mm -hmm. Now when it comes to when it comes to origin, um is that would that be would that be one of the primary um power sets? Exactly. So so think of origins sort of mechanically as sub races, right? Mm -hmm. So there are four birthrights. You can be a human, you can be a post human, you can be a meta human, or you can be an unhuman. Each of those birthrights ties into one of three origin stories. And these are your classic superhero origin stories. You know, there was a lab accident that gave you your powers or, or, you know, you are a mutant or you're an alien or you're a demigod or something like this. Um, and then your power set is a unique feature or, or unique features. They're, they're tied to your origin. So your origin is, is what gives you your power set and you get a feature at first level, a fifth level and 10th level. Mm -hmm. And these thematically tie into, you know, whatever your particular power set or your particular origin might be. Mm -hmm. And, when it comes to class, how would those how would classes be similar and different to um, straight up D and D classes? So um, mechanically, we took ten of the D and D base classes and based our base classes on those, um, with some modifications and tweaks. Some of them um, minimal, uh, and maybe some a little bit more drastic for something like the ranger. Um, and then from there. Um, uh, each class will have uh, various subclass options as well, which are completely all new, all different. And I'd I'd like to go. Th given given that that bring that brings me to one um one particular aspect that a lot of super a lot of supers games have kind of have kind of struggled with in terms of making it relatively. I won't say balanced, but I'll say it's sane, and that is magic use. Since if you look at a lot of other supers games, um, magic as a power is um, is a Joker card for uh, for other powers with extra steps, which ends which sometimes can end up with a with a Inception level of power within a power within a power. <laughs> um, how um, with that kind of with that kind of thing in mind, how? Is is a lot of that just handled through the effects of the um, wizard class, or, or or are there other um, means? 
so the base wizard class um, ha- has access to, to spells the way that they do in D anD D, but each um, in our parlance, these are power. You know, instead of spells, they're sort of power effects. Each powers list is uniquely tailored to the class, um, so that it's sort of for uh, thematic resonance. Um, and w- when you think of magic users in superhero universes, you know, while they're quite powerful, you don't think of them as typically the D and D type of wizard. You know, um, I don't know that I've ever seen Doctor Strange cast Fireball or you know one of these things. Um, they're much more sort of esoteric. They deal with things on the astral plane. Um, they have access to arcane knowledge that um, other heroes don't have. And so we really tried to sort of lean into that um, aspect of what it is to be a wizard in um, in a superhero setting. And then, and then uh, for our subclasses, we tried to um, pull some uh, very specific themes um, so we have like an occult detective, right? So this would be like a John Constantine type character or something mm-hmm. like that who specializes in more um, occult um, pursuits. Mm-hmm. And I was I was actually when it came to the wizard thing, I was actually going to bring up Constantine. I could see him. Th- I could see him casting fireball and it doing no damage, just to mess with somebody. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> because because well well it's Constantine. <laughs> <clears throat> and with that, with that kind of thing in mind, with the you had you had mentioned now, as uh, if I understand it correctly, each each class does is going to have their own um, bit, bits of subclasses. But even even within that, are there are there going to be choices of powers that um, that cla- that classes can get to further personalize? Exactly. Yeah. So each each powers list is um, unique to that class. I mean, there's some crossover where it's thematically appropriate, but each powers list is unique to that class. And so you can learn a set number of powers based on your level, and you can activate those powers a set number of times. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, mostly that um, the one that sort of doesn't exactly break that rule, but is is the herald, which is kind of based on the um, Fifth edition of Warlock, so that they're recharging these powers on a short rest, where everybody else is sort of re- recharging them on a long rest. Mm-hmm. And with, because the main reason that I'd ask that is that is there's obviously the que- whenever it comes to these kind of things, there's the question of um, how big of a factor your choice of class ends up um, playing. And now, with with that in mind, would it be fair of me to say that the secret identity is akin to background in Five E? Exactly. Yeah, and the secret identity, in addition to sort of like um, giving you a skill and giving you some equipment, it's more um, supposed to um, enhance your sort of out of costume play. Mm-hmm. Um, so, who are you when you're not being a superhero? Um, and and sort of lean into that third pillar of of role play um, a bit more. Mm-hmm. Now, with with that in, with that in mind, um, this br- this brings me to this brings me to the question of um, pro- of procurement, since it's um it's di- doing doing the standard GP ca- GP kind of currency approach would be would. End up feeling a bit uh, a bit um silly when you have when you have um su- when you have superhero characters who are known for their large amount of resources. I mean, obviously Batman's the big the big offender in this kind of situation, but I think I think you know where I'm I think you get where I'm going with this. Absolutely. Yes. So in in Legend of the Metaverse, what we try to do is your um in place of GP, you have um, sort of influence points, mm-hmm. and these are um, you sort of uh, earn these on a two to one basis um, as compared to your experience points. So every time that you earn two experience points, you earn one IP uh, influence point or an IP. Mm-hmm. Um, unlike experience points, which only ever go up, I you can spend IP and you spend it to acquire goods or you know um, influence the world around you. Um, and this is meant, you know, it, this is meant to represent, I mean, it could represent money, 
uh, but but not necessarily. Um, it, it also might just represent people wanting to help you out because you're a well-known superhero, or uh, you may have um, connections to um, you know black market arms dealers or, or things like this, where you're um, it, where they're more uh, able to equip you or train you um, than just sort of sort of walking down to like. Um, you know, a gun shop and, and buying a bunch of guns. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, with that in mind, um, I'd I would I would like to I would like to pick your brain on um on on origin on the on the various origins classes and secret identities and what would be and what would be some decent um analogs to some of them regar regarding um uh, regarding um su regarding superheroes in vi in various universes. Um, and then, and then after, and then after that, I can th I can throw in a few names and just see, and just um see and just see where they where they land as a kind of lightning round. Um, sure. So I'll start with origin. Um. Well, I can, actually actually before I do that, I think I should start I think I should start with birthright with one with one question. What would what would be the thematically what would be the difference between a metahuman, a posthuman, and an unhuman? Yeah, so uh, obviously we start with the base human, right? Um, posthuman, uh, posthumans are sort of the next step um, in evolution up from your base human. This could be something like um, a mutant. This could be something like uh, you know your genome was altered in strange and horrific ways in something like a lab accident. This could also be somebody that was purposely augmented. So you know you're a cyborg. Um, you, maybe you agree to undergo this invasive medical procedure to get these abilities. And while you're un unmistakably human, you are also unmistakably something more. And so th those are post-humans. Mm -hmm. Metahumans we viewed as beings that are sort of represent um, humanity's ideals made flesh. So this is something like um, Superman um, or you know, Thor, uh, Loki. You know, these are gods that walk among us, but also um, artificial constructs. So advanced AIs or robots that we create that are then, you know, um, greater than us. Um, and so metahumans are sort of, we viewed them as kind of beings that were sort of above humanity. Um, and then unhumans would be things where they uh, would be uh, kind of creatures where they, um, don't fit into they may not even um be offshoots of humanity per se these are things that you may come from sort of an ancient civilization or you may be a beast folk um you may be a monster these are things um you know swamp thing i guess would would be a, a great um unhuman but so would somebody like namor um where the the path of evolution there you know Maybe they share a common ancestor with man, but but they're but they don't branch off from man per se. All right. So, starting at the top of origins with um, human origins, we have chosen one, peak conditioning, and prodigy. Um, what would be what would be an exa What would be a um, what would be a, what would be an example of each? Sure. Yeah, the chosen one, a good one, would be somebody like Moon Knight, um, where uh, he's a human being that was uh, involved in some nefarious activities in his life. He wanders into this strange Egyptian temple one night uh, near death, and then Khonshu appears to him and uh, selects him as his as his human avatar. As very um, literally a chosen one. Um, uh, peak conditioning would be somebody like Batman or Nightwing. Um, somebody that has no sort of inherent superpowers is not destined necessarily for great things. They just have a very strong work ethic and have sort of, um, managed to, um, forge a mind and a body that lets them sort of do the kind of work that they want to do. And the prodigy is almost the opposite. The prodigy is somebody that is born with these, with these gifts, um, of a great mind or, or a, a strong body. Um, not gifted in the way that sort of a mutant would be. Um, they're still uh, firmly within sort of the human realm of possibilities, um, 
but they're uh, but undeniably they've been been given a gift and this is somebody like tony stark who just has this aura uh, uh yeah i guess tony stark would probably be the best uh just just blessed with these um gifts that that even though he's human most humans don't have these kind of gifts all right so next in the metahuman category would be alien construct and deity and i get the feeling this is going to be one of the easier trinities of of this setup yeah, exactly. So, you know, for your alien, we have something like Superman or um, uh, the Martian Manhunter. Um, y- you know, um, either you have these powers because they're unique to um, your people or uh, something about traveling to Earth. Um, you know, maybe the, the yellow rays of the sun have infused you with, with these with these powers. Um, deities exactly would be something like... Um, Thor or Loki, um, these are, but also something like the new gods. So it's not necessarily a a god from human myth. Maybe you're a god from deep space or something like that. Um, A construct would be something like Red Tornado or Ultron, um, where these are things that have been crafted by human hands, but are much beyond uh, what what humans can do or achieve. And... On the post-human end of things, we ha- the trinity we have is augmented, lab accident, and mutant. Yeah, and the post-human is a little different in that um, you select your um, origin or your you know your your uh, sub race, um, but your power set is not tied to that origin. Instead, there is a um, a post-human table. It's tw- it's twenty different power sets. And uh, when you pick your origin, you roll uh, a d20, and then you get one of the power sets that are on that table. And this is just meant to, um, uh, you know, simulate uh, the fact that sort of, uh, you know, the Fantastic Four would be a great uh, example of a lab accident. So there's four explorers go up into space. They're bombarded by these cosmic rays. Each one of them is hit by the same cosmic ray, but has a completely a different manifestation of their power. Um, and so then we just introduced a little bit of a random element in there. So the Fantastic Four would be a great example of a lab accident or, or Spider-Man or the Hulk. I mean, there's a million of these. Um, uh, mutants would be things like the X-Men um, who, you know, your power is, uh, uh, it's something that that's uh, innate to you uh, and manifests at some point uh, throughout life. Um and uh, augmented again would be somebody where, like a deathlock, maybe where you had um, you've undergone a procedure where you've uh, uh, cybernetics or or uh, an augmented uh, uh, genome uh, that's gifted you with these unique powers. Mm-hmm. And the last trinity under origin we have is beast folk, lost civilization, and monster. Yeah, and so and th- these are the unhuman. So something like a, a, a beast folk would be something like um, you know Killer Croc, or um, uh, I-, I grew up. I was a huge uh, uh, X Force kid at the time. I don't know if you remember Feral from X Force. She was like this kind of like Catwoman kind of thing. I do. Um, yeah, right. Uh, so Feral would be a, a great beast folk. I remember Marvel did this thing years ago where they tried to say that all of these. Um, animalistic mutants came from a different line of evolution. It was like Wolverine, Sabretooth, Feral. There was a bunch of them. They tried to say that they were like lupines or something like that. I think it was retconned uh, fairly quickly after that. But but that would be a good example of something like a Beast Folk. Mm-hmm. Um, Lost Civilization would be somebody like Namor, uh, you know, who comes from Atlantis, or um, Wonder Woman. Uh, who is sort of raised on this uh, invisible island or this long forgotten island, that kind of thing. Um, and then monsters uh, is a broad category. So you could have, like I said, you could have something like Swamp Thing, who I think is undeniably a monster, but you could also have something like Spawn. Um, again, just firmly rooting myself in 90s comics. Mm. But Spawn would make a, 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 be an example of something like that. Um, uh, Morbius, the living vampire, uh, Werewolf by Night, any of these guys would, would make for great monsters. Oh. Now, when it comes to class, um, instead instead of instead of doing a instead of doing a example, um, I'd like to I'd like to put a bit of a spin on it. Given given the fact that we're building that this is built a lot on the 
framework of um, 5e. <clears throat> I'd like I'd I'd like to I'd like to delve into each to eat to each class's um D and D analog and also what also what they're doing differently compared to the um the source material. And to that end I'll start with um Brawler. Yeah, and so so Brawler is your fighter. Uh, oh, well I guess we'll start here. We'll, we'll say the uh, so once you've selected your um your uh, birthright and your origin these are this is where you get whatever sort of unique powers or whatever sort of powers are unique to you so you know there are many people in in this universe who have the, who have um, powers but but these powers are unique to you and they come from somewhere inside of you like i said either you were born with them or you had this um, astonishing rebirth that gifted you with these powers your class is more what you do um mm -hmm. And so the brawler, uh, like I said, our base classes are based on the uh, fifth edition base classes. So our brawler is our fighter, and a brawler is somebody that likes to get up in the mix, um, likes to uh, uh, be up close and personal, uh, very comfortable in combat, um, and uh, that's where they kind of really shine. Oh, all right. So ne next would be the champion. Champions are um, are heroes that um, are beholden to an ideal um, and are also transformed by that ideal. So this would be something like um, I think he's called Shazam now, but when I was growing up, he was Captain Marvel, Cap right? Captain Marvel. The on the only reason he's called Shazam is because is because uh, is because of that whole that whole le that whole legal window that that happened back in the day. Yeah, but yeah. He he is Captain Marvel. Anyone who calls him Shazam, I will simply say it is a, this is a free country, and you are free to be wrong because you are. <laughs> um, and the interesting thing is, you know, he was Captain Marvel before Marvel Comics existed. He was um, he was ca he was not originally a DC character. <clears throat> no, he's a Fawcett character. It was a Fawcett, and he was one of the characters that was highlighted when. DC decided to get so happy about so-called Superman clones. Yeah. Um, but there was a brief window between when Fawcett went under and when um, when DC acquired Fawcett, and at, and around that time, Union, what was known as Union Comics, acquired the acquired the name, which is why they have to keep putting out um, Marvel in or Captain Marvel care um, comics to keep the trademark. Mm-hmm. And that's leaving aside the Marvel Man Miracle Man uh, debacle, um, yeah. but yeah. So, so champions, uh, you know, Captain Marvel is the is the epitome of a champion, right? He just yells Shazam, mm -hmm. and he is literally transformed um, into this champion, and he has his ideals. You, you know, um, that's what he is. Uh, that's what sort of um, drives him to to be a hero. Uh, the Hulk would also, I think, be something like uh, uh, would be driven by an ideal, much less noble than uh, Captain Marvel. But you know, the idea of strength and anger and power, um, and obviously the Hulk undergoes a, a pretty violent transformation. But also, I think somebody like Captain America would be a great example of a champion. Mm -hmm. um, he has his ideals, and his transformation, um, you know, n not as pronounced as somebody like Captain Marvel or. Uh, the Hulk, but but still uh, uh, undergoes a bit of a transformation when he when he puts the costume on and, he, and he's wearing the shield. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's our idea, our, our kind of our idea of what a champion is. All right. Next would be um, conduit. Yeah. So conduits are uh, energy based heroes, um, each with their own unique kind of domain and this is kind of playing off of the cleric domains in the fifth edition mm -hmm. so this is going to be people that can manipulate flame or ice um we have a uh class that uh manipulates electricity electricity but it does it through sort of static electricity mm -hmm. this is a not this is not a static shock um but also you know the human torch or ice man or um uh siren uh again with my x-force uh, uh uh affinities um magnetism is another one that we have that you can you can use and so the, yeah these are heroes that uh, manipulate the sort of the primal forces of the universe mm -hmm. so next would be gadgeteer which i get the feeling is going to be fairly self-explanatory 
Yeah, exactly. And, and these are uh, people that use gadgets to give themselves an edge. So this is somebody that wears a suit like Iron Man or somebody that just has a lot of fun gadgets on hand like Batman um, or, or somebody like Spider-Man who has gadgets that allow him to do a very specific and thematic thing. Thing. So, you know, I have these gadgets that let me you know, do what a spider can, essentially. Mm -hmm. You just couldn't help yourself, could you? I mean, you you have to. <laughs> what what self-respecting superhero game would not have a Spider-Man analog in it? You know, a legally distinct Spider-Man analog. Let's be clear. Yes, the best. Ca <laughs> technically correct. The best kind of correct. <laughs> um, but next would be Harold. Harold, yes. Yeah. So Heralds are. Um, this is based on the fifth edition Warlock, and these are beings who acquire their power from or, or uh, who are gifted with a mission and uh, additional powers based on a being that they serve. So the classic example of the Herald is um, Silver Surfer, but there are other ones. Spawn is a kind of Herald. He's sort of this Herald of Hell. Um, somebody like uh, the Green Lantern or the Lantern Corps, um, you know, they serve this um, uh, peacekeeping force uh, or these energy batteries. And so that's where they draw their energy from or their power from. Um, and so they are heralds of um, th these. Uh, Would Ghost Rider uh, also count as a herald? Absolutely. Yeah. And one of the heralds, you know, you, there's a, uh, a, you get a pact boon. Mm -hmm. I think it's at third level. And one of them is the uh, pact of the rider. And you get a, a mount, a vehicle. And uh, yeah, Ghost Rider was, uh, you know, you can get a, it can be a motorcycle or a horse or, uh, you know, this kind of thing. But Ghost Rider was at the top of our list of, um, of heralds. Mm -hmm. So next would be the Marksman, which I, th I think is another one that's going to be self-explanatory. Yeah. And so uh, this is based on the Ranger. So it took a little bit more finessing than some of the other classes. Because um, the Ranger is a, is a snake bit class. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, I, I'm one of these guys. I buy um, Wizard's line on the Ranger, which is that the Ranger is a class that has some great features if you're doing wilderness exploration. The problem is a lot of campaigns just don't. Um, and so I, I don't have I, – I'm one of these guys. I don't necessarily have a problem with the base Ranger per se in, in a D&D &D campaign, uh, one where there, there, there will be time for them to shine or opportunities for them to shine. But in the, uh, a superhero game – you know, wilderness exploration is not sort of necessarily high on the list. So, so this one took a little bit more finessing and your marksmen are going to be, um, uh, people like a green arrow or a Hawkeye who have these special, um, uh, gadget arrows. This is going to be people like, uh, the Punisher or judge dread who, um, use fear and intimidation, uh, as well as like a, an arsenal of, of deadly weapons, but also, um, somebody like Deadpool or Deathstroke, who is equally at home, up close, and personal as they are fighting at range. Mm -hmm. um, so next would be Mentalist. Yeah, and so uh, these are people that who uh, their uh, unique feature is their mind. Mm -hmm. And so um, on a basic level, this is somebody like Jean Grey, who has sort of advanced telepathy and telekinesis. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, somebody uh, like Psylocke, who is a, a warrior who um, you know uses her psionic abilities to augment her physical prowess, mm -hmm. um, and then also somebody who um, whose brain works in a way that is uh, makes them almost uh, uh, precognitive. You know, their mm -hmm. their their calculations and thinking are so far advanced that they can almost predict what's going to happen before it happens. Mm -hmm. uh, so next would be the primalist. Primalists are people that um, uh, they're not necessarily energy based in the way that the conduit is, um, but they are very much concerned with nature. Um, and so the, obviously this is based in the fifth edition Druid. And while it does have a shape shifting component to it, um, it also has some uh, features that are um, very unique to, uh, in regards to healing uh, interactions with animals and even being able to adopt um, animal traits. Mm -hmm. And so these would be um, a storm would, would be a great primalist because she could sort of controls the weather uh, um, swamp thing or man thing uh, would be what we would term an arboreal avenger. So this is a, this is a primalist who has sort of like adopted the shape or the, uh, the psyche uh, of a plant. Um, 
And then also um, somebody like, uh, I don't know if you're um, uh, uh, an Alpha Flight fan, but, but you know, uh, Shaman, mm. uh, who has sort of his, his bag of tricks that he can utilize. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> I was also tempted to bring up th- um, characters like Swamp Thing or um, Green World. Yeah, and so uh, um, yeah, pri- would be make great primalists. Um, you know, at at some point, I think at tenth level, the uh, arboreal avenger, y- you can choose to just stay in your plant form forever if you'd like, and you can mm-hmm. you know activate your power effects in that plant form. And you know, it's it's a thing where you don't know if you're a man who dreamed himself a plant or a plant who dreamed himself a man, that kind of thing. Oh, it could it could be worse. You could be an ant. Right. Sure. <laughs> oh. Next would be skirmisher, and I've got some. I got a bit of a guess as to as to what that is, given given um given the era of comic books that you grew up in. Yeah, so skirmishers are based on the fifth edition monk, and the idea here is these are people that uh, hit hard and strike fast, and then get away, get out of harm's way, because maybe you're not as tough as a champion or as a brawler. Um, and so at a base level, this is something like the Flash, who's literally just too fast for you to hit. Mm-hmm. But then also somebody like Nightcrawler, who's able to sort of teleport out of harm's way. Mm-hmm. And then also somebody like Nightwing or Daredevil, this this um, uh, who has sort of this acrobatic grace and athleticism, where they're able to hit you and then sort of vault off of you or, or, or caterwaul around and, and make it hard for you to hit them. Mm-hmm. And the last one is Wizard. Yeah, and uh, wizard is is exactly what it says on the tin. It's a wizard. Um, but again, we, we try to distinguish ourselves from, from the fifth edition um, wizard in, in, thematically with the subclasses. So we have an occult detective, which would be somebody like John Constantine. We have a sovereign sorcerer, which is legally distinct from a sorcerer supreme. Mm-hmm. Um, and this would be somebody like uh, a Doctor Strange, who where you can actually uh, apply the sorcerer meta magics um, to your wizard spells. And then we have a quantum wizard. This is a wizard who um, communes with himself across the multiverse. Mm-hmm. So can call on himself for aid or for trickery's purposes or um, to sort of distract or dismay his foes. Mm-hmm. Now, with that in mind, like I, like I said before, I'd like to do a bit of a lightning round to kind of um, to kind to kind of to kind of see where where um, certain other characters we haven't mentioned or certain archetypes, including some of my own. Um, might, might, fa- might fall in, might fall in line with this. Yeah, I'd love to. So, I'm, so I'm, I'm going, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a few names, and I, and I want to, I want to see, um, where they, where they would fit in this setup. Sounds good. Um, Iron Fist. Iron Fist is a is a human chosen one living weapon, uh, and the living weapon. Oh, sorry, I should say. Brawler is the base class, and then Living Weapon is the subclass. Mm-hmm. And the Living Weapon class actually lets you channel your soul uh, into either a weapon or one fist. Um, and this was very much our um, our homage to Iron Fist. Mm-hmm. Um, Blade. Blade. Uh, okay, Blade's an interesting one. Um, so I would I would personally classify Blade as an unhuman. Um, I, he's he's uh, I know he's not a full vampire, but uh, uh, in my mind he is uh, monstrous enough. So Blade would be a, a, an unhuman monster, and very much a mercenary, um, because Blade uh, feels very comfortable uh, wielding uh, ranged weapons. At one point, even he had a gun hand. I don't know if you remember this. I do. Uh, one, of the, one of his hands was a gun, um, but also has to get up close to stake you. So um, Blade would be a, a an, un, an unhuman monster mercenary. Um, Storm. Storm would be a uh, post-human mutant. Mm-hmm. Um, if your GM is generous enough to allow you to to select on the post-human table as opposed to rolling on the post-human table, I would pick Flight uh, for Storm, and then she would be a Primalist Weather Witch. Uh, all right. Um, to shift to shift away from Marvel characters for a bit and go in, and go into a bit of the Indies. Um, sure. Shadow Man. Shadow Man. Okay. Shadow Man. Ugh. Shadow Man's a bit of a tough one. I would say probably I would say Shadow Man would be a human chosen one. He'd probably be most comfortable as a wizard occult detective. 
not I know Shadow Man is not specifically a detective, but I think that he deals with, enough with the occult that that's probably where he he well the his, most at his home. thing his thing is all about vood his thing is all about voodoo so yeah so you so you're not too far you're not too far off on that um we already we already brought we already brought up um Sp we already brought up Spawn so I, yes. I, so I won't um I won't I won't double dip into that because you beat me to it damn it. Um, I'm very happy that he was on your list, though. That makes me feel very good. <laughs> um, let, I'll sh I'll shift into I'll shift into D I'll shift into DC for a bit with um, Blue Beetle, specifically um, Jaime Reyes uh, Blue Beetle. Sure. Yeah, I think Blue Beetle would be best as a human prodigy uh, gadgeteer. Um, now. Uh... Yeah, I think if we're going going to go with uh, the Reyes Blue Beetle, I think he's probably most comfortable as a hardwired hero. This is a hero who dons a suit. Mm -hmm. um, uh, older incarnations of Blue Beetle, I think, would probably be better as a uh, cerebral crime fighter. This is this is a gadgeteer that has a number of sort of gadgets that he can deploy uh, mm -hmm. in different situations. Yeah. Um. Now, now, I'd like to go into an. I'd like to go into a um a cult a cult favorite of of mine on the DC on the street level DC end of things, the question. Okay, uh, hmm, the question I can see as, well, I I would say human. I, I'm sort of uh, uh a toss up between. Uh, a chosen one because the question sort of has this sort of um, higher calling. He's a sort of a figure, uh, a, a, a predestined figure, or a figure at least that has a strong calling of fate versus a, a peak conditioning. Um, and then in terms of class and subclass, I would probably say. Hmm, I would probably put. Um, the question, just given the power set, I'd probably say that the question would be a skirmisher, a skirmisher acrobat. Um, this is somebody that can get in there, uh, tussle, mix it up in close, and then get away before bad things happen. And while he does have a handful, well, he does have a handful of gadgets. It's, I wouldn't say it's enough for him to be considered a gadgeteer, since yeah, exactly. So his his primary form of gadgetry is ju is just using um is just using various gases to disguise himself. Yes. Um, although spe oh, speaking speaking of the speaking of disguises um this is this is board this is borderline superhero-y, but um the shadow. Yes, I love the shadow. Let me just say that personally. <laughs> um the sh I would say um and I'm this is up for debate. But the way that I would play the shadow is I would be a uh, human chosen one. I would be a mentalist, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, because the shadow has that voice where he can sort of, um, uh, you know, make men confess to things or, or, or plumb their depth, the depths of their soul. Um, mm -hmm. so I would play the shadow as a human chosen one, um, mentalist, uh, and, a, and a psionic warrior. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't now. I can't. Men I can't mention one major pulp figure without me without mentioning another one that I gr that I grew up on, um, even if it was the future version of him, and that is the Phantom. The Phantom, I think, is is um, I, I hmm. well, you know, the Phantom does have. He is a long. He comes from a long line of phantoms. Mm -hmm. So in that way, he you know he has a sort of a destiny. He could easily be a chosen one figure. I could also easily see him being a peak conditioned human, mm -hmm. um, unmistakably a brawler. Um, uh, he, I could see if playing on a team, uh, if being a part of a team, I could see the uh, phantom being a battlefield captain. Um, using his sort of tactical know-how to uh, to aid his friends while leading from the front, but I could also see the Phantom being uh, what we have termed a lone wolf. Uh, this is a brawler who feels very much at home by themselves. Um, you know, thick in the fray, um, their their enemies piling up at their feet as they sort of knock them unconscious. Mm -hmm. Now, 
I know you meant I know you mentioned ba I know you mentioned Batman as one example, but I'm curious if there's one member of the Bat family who I even if it's the extended Bat family who I'd be curious if they if they would um if their if their if their particular kit would ch would change rel relative to relative to the OG and that is Terry McGinnis. I'm not familiar with Terry McGinnis. Remind um, me Terry McGinnis. Bat Batman Beyond. Oh, I, I I missed Batman Beyond. I was of an age where um, I knew it was uh, around. I knew it was good, um, but uh, it was just kind of just outside my wheelhouse. But uh, as I understand, uh, and, and forgive me because I don't know too much about Batman Beyond, but I think that he does have a a kind of suit that he uses, right? Yes. He, so he might be best as a while. I think your base Batman would probably be best as a gadgeteer. Um, cerebral crime fighter uh and in fact that that class that subclass even has a uh a d legally distinct utility belt that you can use mm -hmm. batman beyond might be best as a um as a hardwired hero i i could i could see i could see that now i did mention a few i did mention a few archetypes of my own um a long t a long time ago as a bit as a bit of an experiment well not not so long ago it was just it's just a while back that i revived this on um, Geekwatch, because I have a um, I have a random hero creator program for um, for Marvel Heroic that I that I would use when I need to when I needed to pull heroes and villains out of my ass. Um, sure. <laughs> but um, I a few months back, as a bit of an experiment, because of the fact that if, that so that my co my colleagues on my colleagues on the podcast um, are fa are fans of My Hero Academia. Um, I just I decided what if we what if we created a a hero a a hero course for U, for UA's Great Lakes hypothetical Great Lakes branch and I put up um ten I put up ten heroes and we basically had to um interpret the randomization to come up with um hero the ten heroes in training and their particular quirks um <clears throat> and if you if you don't mind, I'd like I'd like to go th I'd like to go through those and see how they'd be interpreted in this particular setup. Sure. Um. So the fir so the first one that I have, give just give me a moment because I need to gr I need to grab the um, document because the one the one that I th ah. Let's see. Okay, I got. Th Sorry about that. Um, of the course. One, the first one that I have is um f is Foxfire, whose qu whose quirk is basically a, basically the kind of things you would expect from a um, Kitsune. They have a they have a fox they have a fox like a they have a fox like appearance. They ha they have they have multiple tails. They are good. They're good. They have. The ability to make illu illusions and some a bit and some fire manipulation. Okay, I think you can go one or, two, or you can go a couple different ways with this. Mm -hmm. I think if you wanted to be a true fox uh, folk, uh, you would pick uh, unhuman beast folk as your origin, um, and uh, in terms of the fire manipulation, then you would be a, a conduit of the flame domain. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, if you wanted to try a post-human um uh maybe something like a mutant where you were sort of born uh relatively normal but at some at some point in, in your life or maybe you're even born sort of a bit abnormal like a nightcrawler situation where you had these kind of fox like appearances mm -hmm. um which and you manifested powers later uh you could uh, you could then do a, a post human mutant uh, and you could take the animal or, or take, or if you're lucky enough to roll on the post human table, or if your GM was generous enough to allow you to pick on the, on the post human table, you could then pick the animal adaptations power set, mm -hmm. um, which would grant you, uh, 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 several abilities that I think would, would mesh pretty well with the Fox. Mm -hmm. Um, next is Jet Falcon, who's, who's, ba who's basically a, um, ba basically it, bas basically a technokinetic. Essentially, able to able to control technology, imp improvise improvise and building and rebuilding stuff on the fly, to essentially give him extremely improvised um p 
po power armor that lo that looks more like an exosuit than it does po than it does actual power armor. Interesting. And so, is this something that he's crafted, or something that he is? Is it a part of him? Um, he's it is a it. it He's essentially able to essentially able to control um te control technologies, okay ar around him, um and then use using that he's able to t he's able to take that technology ap apart and then um and then cr and then construct that around him like a like a makeshift exosuit. I see, but but at, at his base he is he's a human being. Yes. So for him, what I would probably do is we'd probably do human prodigy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would take a little swerve here out of the gadgeteer class. I know it seems like that might be where he belongs, but I actually put him in the Herald class because uh, one of the Herald patient, uh, patrons that we have is the machine patron. And I would picture him more sort of like a cyborg kind of character where he um, uh, uh, he's merged with this uh, advanced machinery in such a way that um, – or, or forms such a relationship with it that, that that's where he gets his powers from. And so I would probably uh, say that he would be a Herald – uh, with the machine patron. All right. Um, now this one might be a bit tricky, but next one is um, har is um, hard case, whose whose quirk is is called sandcastle because the appro we we decided to do it when we rolled this one. This was this had the mimic power, but we decided to do a different approach. He he can he can he can mimic powers, but he can't do it directly. He has to create um constructs that mimic that mimic the power for him. Ah, uh, I see. Um interesting. We we do have a conduit subclass that is not in the um text only rules PDF that's released in the Kickstarter because it was actually a stretch goal. It's the parasite um uh, domain. And this is a conduit subclass that um can mimic the powers of others or sort of uh, absorb their powers in the way that maybe something like rogue could mm -hmm. um, specifically a, a creature that could create um, constructs though. I, I think you'd probably best be served by um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Herald class. And one of the boons that you can get as a Herald is um, uh, the prism boon. Mm -hmm. And this allows you to create sort of hard light constructs uh, a la Green Lantern, uh, where you could sort of move them around the battlefield, use them to attack creatures, and uh, depending on um, how they were attuned, uh, what sort of unique frequency and color you had attuned them to, also has other effects on, on you know, uh, yourself, your enemies, or your allies. Yeah. Now, next is Pacha Kamak, whose, <laughs> whose quirk is um, Huaka. Um, the ba the basic the basic setup is that he's able to manipulate any um earth to create um weapons and armor around himself specifically earth based though yeah yeah so i would probably he would probably be a primalist mm -hmm. uh one of the um uh sort of wild shapes that we have you know we could kind of replace the the wild shape where you're able to uh, assume the form of an animal um but you can adopt sort of an aspect of nature. Uh, uh, there's three options there, and you, you choose whichever one suits you each time you activate this, this ability. Uh, one is uh, 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 aspect of the sky, one is aspect of the sea, but one is aspect of the land. And it does exactly kind of what you're describing here, where um, it, he can uh, hit harder, um, you know, as he's sort of like surrounding his fists with earth. It gives him, uh, makes him uh, tough to move. So you're uh, you'd have advantage on like um, grapple checks or, or checks meant to 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 move you against your will. Um, makes you hardier. Um, so I think that's probably be the the best place for him. Mm -hmm. um, I should I should note that he would that he wouldn't be he wouldn't be using earth assisted punches. He'd just, he'd end up make he'd end up making say, say a war club and sh and shield. Ah, um, uh, I see. As part as part of his setup, um, very cool. Next is um, vibrato, who whose qu whose quirk is um, diaphragm. Vibrato is a is a per is a near is a near per is a perfect shapeshifter. Um, 
to the to the point that it to the point that it's um, that it's almost it's almost impossible to tell the difference as long as he as long as he slash she slash it because he, because even vibrato doesn't doesn't have any idea anymore um, to um keep keeps up the keeps up the act very cool and then so uh shape-shifting abilities uh, is there any sort of um you mentioned the perfect diaphragm so is it sort of just mimicking speech or do they have sort of sonic powers as well they, there are um, so, some degree, some degree of so, some degree of sonic power is tied to his um, speaking. So he, okay. so he can speak. He can speak and have the point of origin of that sound come from somewhere else. Very cool. Yeah, I think we had the perfect setup for you. So you'd be a post-human, um, uh, uh, depending on uh, how vibrato got his powers, either augmented mutant or a lab accident. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, on the post-human table, uh, there's a shapeshifter option, uh, which gives you some uh, really cool uh, shapeshifting abilities. I think that'd be perfect. And then for his class, um, uh, we have a, uh, uh, a vibration domain um, in the conduit class. And so this is about, um, you can do ventriloquism, sound mimicry. You can use your voice to... Uh, um, uh, dampen um, sound around you, you and your allies, um, as well as sound-based attacks and that kind of thing. So I think that'd be a pretty good setup for for vibrato. Mm -hmm. um, the next one that I have is Backdraft, who is a, is essentially a energy killer. Um, the whole the whole the whole approach is that it's it started with it started with a um. With the fact that they ne that they negate ex they negate ex they can negate excess heat that's touching them, um, but it, and then ex and then expanded into um, effect that at at certain extremes being being um not resistant to physical damage but resistant to most types of energy damage. Yeah, and this is interesting um, because we sort of ran into this with the with the conduit base class and its subclasses. Mm -hmm. So the subclasses, the domains have specific um, uh, energy types that they deal with, so fire or ice or this kind of thing. But at their base, they're all energy manipulators. And so the way that, the way that that works is that when you choose your domain, you get an energy affinity. So if you choose the, the flame domain, you get affinity to fire. And so at any point when you activate a conduit power effect that deals damage, you can choose to have that damage type be fire. Mm. But it doesn't necessarily always have to be fire. If the power effect does a different type of damage or manipulates a different type of energy, that's okay too. Um, and so uh, I think that would be a, a, a pretty good fit here. So I would pick the conduit as the base class. I would pick the flame domain as the uh, subclass with the understanding that you could still manipulate these other energy fields. Yeah. And um, something I should make clear is that they is that they can't fu they can't um, manipulate energy themselves. They mer they merely kill excess energy around them. Oh, I see. Interesting. Yeah, the 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 the, the conduit sort of definitely does manipulate energy. I, I guess you can sort of flavor that uh, however you choose. The the, the flame uh, domain though does have an ability where. Uh, your character is able to absorb the energy of um, open flames nearby, and can use these for several various effects. Mm -hmm. um, so next one is um, Sonic Bloom, who is um, norm normally it's it would it would appear to be a speedster, but n but it's a case where they um, their speed their speed isn't through tapping the speed force or something like that, but rather. Creating the creating these um creating these wind creating these wind tunnels through air manipulation to get to give them um be, to give them beeline beeline speeds in specific directions. Essentially, they essentially they use air to ca to cannonball themselves. Interesting. I think there's a couple ways we can go here. Um, we have a speedster um, subclass f for the skirmisher, um, which can certainly um you know, it kind of mimics your typical abilities that you expect to find from somebody like the Flash or Quicksilver, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, and then uh, for their uh, uh, birthright and origin, um, there is a uh, post-human uh, that uh, one of the power sets uh, where you're able to sort of um, 
rocket yourself uh, or kind of turn yourself into a human rocket. Mm-hmm. Um, it, 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 it grants you increased speed um, and, and it's a thing that you sort of, um, it's not as though you, you constantly have th- this increased speed. It's, it's a thing that you need to sort of activate um, and, and turn yourself into this sort of speed force kind of thing. Um, I think that would probably be a good fit. So I would say post-human uh, taking the um, the human rocket power set and then combining that with the uh, skirmisher class and the speedster subclass to give you the, the, the flavor and the mechanical benefits there. Mm-hmm. Um, next is Hadron, whose whose main whose main ability is bo- is both space time manipulation and um gra- and gravity control. Very nice. Yeah, we um uh again another one of the um subclasses of the conduit that we were going to um use as a stretch goal would be gravity manipulation. Um I think that would be the absolute ideal fit. Um but in the absence of that, I think that the, the uh conduit domain uh, or, or the conduit class with the magnetic domain, which is in the text only rules PDF. Uh, I think you could reflavor a, f- a fair amount of those abilities as um, gravity manipulation. Yeah. Um, next is Cordyceps, who um, whose whose quirk is um, seed bed. Essentially, um, they're able to they're able to manipulate pl- they're able to manipulate plants by by effectively um, placing placing seeds in ver- in various holes all all over their body. Essentially, essentially, um, that's they put it in there. They're able to control the growth of that of that particular plant and manipulate it. Very cool. Yeah, I think this is the classic Arboreal Avenger here. Um, you know, uh, in Legends of the Metaverse, the Arboreal Avenger is able to sort of transform into this plant monster. But in addition to that, even when they're not transformed, they have um, ties to. Uh, plants and nature and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that the up Royal adventure would probably be the, the best fit there. Yeah. The, the last one is, um, through Gelmir, who, whose quirk, whose quirk title is, um, Jotun. So that should, that should give you a bit, a bit of an <laughs> idea on, on what, on what he, on what he can do is he is based he is ba- he is basically um he's basically somebody who can go who can go up to tw- up to twenty five feet tall. Yeah, and and this I think the the perfect fit for this would be the uh, champion class using the subclass Path of the Powerhouse, mm-hmm. uh, which actually lets you grow large and increases your strength and durability, lets you throw your your pals across the battlefield and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I should I should note that when that when I was trying to visualize him, I kept thinking of. What if you? What if? What if? Col- what if Colossus had had the build of the of the mountain from ga- from Game of Thrones, but was it? But was st- was still as mu- was still as much of a jovial type as he is. <laughs> <laughs> like he's already he's already a bit he's already a big guy who helps who helps out everyone he can at the gym, and well, when it comes to, when it comes to hero work, he just becomes an even bigger guy. Right. Yeah. He's just still just a big nice guy. Mm-hmm. Um, the the last one in, is the one that I've used as my I've used as my avatar, that's that, and I've used as a kind of mascot for some of my reviews, and that is Alden Zavik Robinson, who's his his whole thing is being an ice manipulator, specifically creating um ice constructs of melee weapons. Very cool. Yeah, and I think that this fits uh, perfectly with the. Um... Uh, the conduit class with the uh, frost uh, domain, mm-hmm. um, which lets you um, uh, craft things out of ice, um, sh- uh, shield your enemy. There's even an ice slide feature um, that lets you kind of get around the battlefield with an ice slide. Um, mm-hmm. I think that'd be a pretty good fit. Yeah. Now, one of one other thing I w- one other thing I wanted to t- I wanted to touch on that's been brought up is um, enhanced combat. Um. What what are some of the things that you're that you're changing compared to the compared to the core rule set when it comes to the combat loop? I, it, one of the things that's really important, I feel like thematically, to, to make the game feel like a superhero game is being able to destroy the environment. Um, 
and you know it's just when a fight breaks out and people are getting punched through buses and things like that or people are throwing buses mm -hmm. um or you i or feel using like car, or using cars as 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 improvised gauntlets exactly yeah exactly um that's the dream uh you know when you're when you're imagining what it's like to be a superhero um and base D and D, I think doesn't um it's not that there aren't rules for that kind of stuff i, I just don't know that they're uh, implemented uh, a whole lot and so the idea here was just to include um information that's both player facing and gm facing to let everybody know that that kind of thing is not only encouraged but here are some ways that you can do it mm -hmm. so that everything on the battlefield um will have a sort of uh, an ac and hit points and this is not something that needs to be tracked um religiously by a, a gm you don't want to make the gm's job super hard but you but you know broadly speaking you know if somebody's going to try to smash through some concrete or, or smash through a city bus. This is, this is your AC. This is your hit points. Mm. Um, and I think GMs can get nervous about that stuff because the idea is if you, not that you want to keep your players on rails, but if there's areas where you don't want your players to go through, you know, you don't want them to be able to just smash through a wall and bypass the villain's base that you spent weeks and weeks carefully constructing. Um, and there, there are safety places greater guardrails in place to make sure that that doesn't happen uh, for the GM. But then also, again, to just empower the player to say, you know, feel free to sort of smash some concrete and then pick it up on your next turn and hurl a big block of concrete at somebody's head. Um, or, you know, punch somebody through a bus and pick up half that bus and throw it at them, that kind of thing. Yeah. Now, with all, with, all that, with all that in mind, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the project? So uh, if we fund, we will, uh, the rules are, um, the core rule book, I should say, is written. It, it does need to be proofread. It does need to be line edited. And then um, we uh, have our designer working to, uh, you know, incorporate that into a nice little package, um, as well as the um, uh, uh, optional uh, adventure um Trouble at Tomorrow Tower, which will take players through level one through five. That mm -hmm. uh, is also written, um, but does need to be edited. Uh, most of our time will be taken um, in commissioning and receiving art. Um, we're hoping to have all that wrapped up by March so that we can get the files to the printer March 1st. Um, time frame from when we get, we're trying to build in a nice little cushion uh, from the time that we get the files to the printer to the time the printer tells us that we'll receive the shipment to the time that we actually think that we're going to receive the shipment. But uh, if we can get the files to the printer, uh, the, the beginning of March, we'll then have those uh, books to our distributing partner um, by uh, the beginning of July and distribution can begin in earnest at that point. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, I will I will certainly be keeping an eye out um for for how for how this particular thing develops and thank you for humoring my little um my little experiment I fig I figured put I figured it'd be best to put the um creation system through its paces because of the sheer variety of stuff you can potentially do with supers games. Oh, absolutely. No, that was great fun. Um with with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the ma enjoy the madness. Thank you so much for having me, man. This was a great time. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to discuss, whether it's to further discuss Legends of the Metaverse, whether it's to theory craft about about various about various characters and how you'd adapt them, or just or just to do a glorified shit post about what about why um. Why, <coughs> why, why, um, why the in why the indies are better than the big two? Um, <laughs> the door is always open to you. As I often say around is. here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thanks so much, Matt. I appreciate it. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, 
I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.